All right, calling case A828840, Red Rock Financial Services versus Nona Tobin. Appearances, please, counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. Stephen Scow here on behalf of Red Rock. Good morning, Your Honor. Vanessa Turley on behalf of Nation Star. Okay. Um, and Ms. Tobin, the time is 10.45. This matter was set for 10 a.m. Ms. Tobin has not appeared. We just attempted to phone her and she did not answer the phone. Um, currently on for today, get my notes. you guys can be seated, was um, request for judo judicial notice of verified complaints of attorney misconduct filed with the State Bar of Nevada versus Brittany Wood. The same for Joseph Hong. Um, and then defendant Nona Tobin's corrective motion for an order to show cause why written findings of attorney misconduct should not be forwarded to the state bar. We've got coming up on our chamber's calendar on February the 8th, a motion to withdraw these motions that were set for today. Um, and then we've got set for the uh, and then she also filed. So what's on for the chamber's calendar is a motion to withdraw Tobin, Tobin's motion for an order to show cause why written findings of attorney misconduct should not be forwarded to the state bar. Motion to withdraw Tobin's counterclaims and cross claims versus Red Rock, Nation Star, and Wells Fargo. Motion to modify grounds for Tobin's petitions for sanctions versus Red Rock and Nation Star to include NRS 357-040 and NRS 199.210, NRS 205.0824, and NRS 205.0833, and NRS 41.1395, and motion to adopt Tobin's proposed final judgment order. And then on February the 28th, there is defendant Nona Tobin's motion to reconsider the January 16th, 2023 order and renewed motion to strike non-party Red Rock Financial Services LLC rogues filings. To the extent that there was an opposition that was done um, by Red Rock Financial Services on the motions for today and also on the basically that was kind of a notice of non-opposition to the motion to withdraw the other issues. Um, I have indicated to, I'm indicating to council now that I do not feel that it is necessary for them to file an opposition to the motion to reconsider um, that is set to be heard on the 8th or on the 28th, nor do I find it necessary for them to file an opposition to the motions that are set for in chambers for February the 8th. And here's the reason why. I am advancing all motions to today. Ms. Tobin continues to argue that Red Rock Financial Services is not a party to this case. It is very clear that Ms. Tobin does not understand the nature of an interpleader complaint. Red Rock Financial Services is a party to this case. They have interpled funds. That is the only thing that is at issue in this case. This court, they filed a complaint in interpleader. Ms. Tobin filed cross claims and answer and cross claims and counter claims to which this court dismissed on the basis of claim preclusion. There was a motion to reconsider that was brought. The court denied that motion to reconsider. And at the hearing back on, I have so many notes. At the hearing 
back on July the 7th, there was a hearing and the plaintiff asked this court to declare Ms. Tobin a vexatious litigant. Ms. Tobin filed an opposition to that motion on June the 27th, 2022. The court told her at that hearing that if she continued to file seriatim motions that were without legal or factual merit that the court was going to have no choice but to declare her a vexatious litigant. The court asked her very specifically if she understood at that hearing, if she understood that the court was not going to declare her a vexatious litigant at that point because it was of the opinion that she didn't understand what an interpleader action was and that I attempted to explain that to her. Um, there was subsequently another hearing where we talked about the fact that the Supreme Court had affirmed the decision in the lead case that was involved in which the foreclosure happened where she continues to argue that the claim was wrongly brought and and that it was the house shouldn't have been foreclosed and that that and that she understood she indicated that she understood that the court had affirmed that decision now the order from the july and this is why i wanted you here mr scow because it looked to me in looking at all of this the order from the july hearing didn't actually get entered until January of this year. Accurate? And I believe that the reason why is because um, she had appealed to the Supreme Court and therefore because she had somewhat brought a writ of mandamus against me for me to specifically enter the orders that she wanted that I was precluded from doing anything until after the Supreme Court came down with their decision and therefore the order wasn't submitted to me because I couldn't do anything until that issue had been decided. Accurate? That is accurate, Your Honor. And the other reason is it took several months to get the transcript. Okay. And, okay. and so that part of it is my fault. Okay. But, but we were also waiting for that red issue to be resolved as well. All right. So to the extent that the Supreme Court basically denied the writ, she asked for reconsideration. That was denied. She asked for a rehearing on Bonk. That was denied. The court received the order. She then filed... And let me get the exact dates here because it will be important for the order that you are going to do, Mr. Scow. So the final decision from the Supreme Court was done on 12-22. Prior, well, there was a Supreme Court order on 11-15 in which they denied the motion for rehearing. On 11-28, she filed a petition for en banc reconsideration. And then on, while that was pending, then she filed on 12-19, the request for judicial notice um, as it pertained to Miss Wood. She also filed a motion for an order to show cause 
why written findings of attorney misconduct should not be forwarded to the state bar on December 19th. She also filed a request for judicial notice as to Mr. Scow. Mr. Hong, I'm trying to get all the people that she did this on. <sighs> David Ochoa, Adam Clarkson. And then on 1220, she filed a motion for order to show cause as a corrected motion for an or order to show cause why written findings of attorney misconduct should not be forwarded to the state bar. On 1222, the Supreme Court issued their order denying the en banc reconsideration. And then on January the 3rd, she filed the motion to withdraw her orders to show cause why written findings of attorney misconduct should not be forwarded to the state bar. The court notes for the record that her original request for judicial notice was based on forty seven point one five zero which says that a judge or a court may take judicial notice whether requested or not number two a judge or court shall take judicial notice if requested by a party and supplied with the necessary information however she failed to address what a court can take judicial notice of, which is defined in 47.130 and 47.140. 47.130 allows the court to take judicial notice of facts that are generally known within the territorial jurisdiction of the trial court or capable of accurate and ready determination by resort to sources whose accuracy cannot reasonably be questioned so that the fact is not subject to reasonable dispute. To the extent that she's asking the court to take judicial notice of attorney misconduct and of findings that were forwarded to the state bar, could I take judicial notice of the fact that she sent a complaint to the state bar? Certainly, I could do that. Could I take judicial notice of the facts contained? No, those are reasonably subject to dispute. So, those five motions that she filed after this court specifically told her to stop filing seriatim motions that were devoid of legal or factual merit fall directly within what this court previously told her not to file. And it does not cure her filing by later filing a motion to withdraw those filings. Additionally, on 1-9, the court entered the order that was submitted by Mr. Scow from the hearing that happened in July. On 116, an amended order was filed, and the court looked at because Ms. Tobin had submitted her proposed changes to Mr. Scow, which on the original motion that was filed on 1-9, there was um, on the signature line, it said not responded or did not respond. And so Mr. Scow, in an abundance of caution, 
submitted the amended order to show what Ms. Tobin's proposed changes were so that I could look at them and see whether or not any of those proposed changes should be adopted by the court. The court read through them specifically, interlineated that order, and specifically stated on the signature line in an annotation, let me get to the end of that order, the court notes that the original order that was signed included an email indicating that there had been no response from Ms. Tobin. As the order comported with the court's findings and order, the court signed it. The court has now received and reviewed Ms. Tobin's comments and therefore deletes the no response language on the signature page, but denies all of Ms. Tobin's proposed changes as they are legally incorrect and or contain argument from her and are not findings or orders made by the court. After the court filed that order, on January the 23rd, Ms. Tobin once again filed a motion to reconsider the 116-2023 order and a renewed motion to strike non-party Red Rock Financial Services rogue filings. It is once again clear that no matter how much this court attempts to explain to Ms. Tobin that she is wrong and that she is misunderstanding what the law is, that she is not willing to listen. And for that reason, a couple things. Let's deal with the motion for reconsideration first. Under Rule 2.24 of the 8th Judicial District Court Rules, it specifically provides no motion once heard and disposed of may be renewed in the same cause nor may the same matters therein embraced be reheard unless by leave of the court granted upon motion therefore after notice of such motion to the adverse parties. A motion to set aside a judgment or order is governed by Rule 60B of the Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure. It states grounds for relief from a final judgment order or proceeding. On motion in just terms, the court may relieve a party or its legal representative from a final judgment order or proceeding for the following reasons. One, mistake, inadvertence, surprise, or excusable neglect. Two, newly discovered evidence that with reasonable diligence could not have been discovered in time to move for a new trial under Rule 59B. Three, fraud, whether previously called intrinsic or extrinsic, misrepresentation or misconduct by an opposing party. Four, the judgment is void. Five, the judgment has been satisfied, released, or discharged, is based on an earlier judgment that has been reversed or vacated or applying it prospectively is no longer equitable. Or six, any other reason that justifies relief. Ms. Tobin moved this court to reconsider its decisions and orders that were previously made on the July 22nd hearing as well as the decisions that were made back in November of 2021 and May of 2021. She did not seek leave of this court to do so as required by EDCR 2.24a. Furthermore, she did not identify which of the six grounds for relief from a final order would justify relief or reconsideration. To the extent that she attempts, and this is giving her the benefit of the doubt in and stretching this as far as I possibly could, to the extent that she is attempting to make the argument possibly that the grounds for relief would be that the judgment is void because Red Rock Financial Services is not a party, she is simply wrong. Red Rock Financial Services is a party in this case they are the interpleader in this case. She filed cross claims against them and therefore um, 
she is just simply wrong and doesn't give a legally valid basis as to why this court should reconsider its prior decision. Moreover, she didn't seek leave from the court under Rule 2.24a to file a motion for reconsideration, and therefore this motion in and of itself comes under the court's previous statements to her that were incorporated at One second. That were incorporated in paragraph 13 of the order that was filed on June or on January the, the 16th of 2023, in which the finding was. Red Rock filed an opposition and a counter motion to have Tobin deemed a vexatious litigant. On January 19th, 2022, the court heard the matter and once again denied Tobin's claims, except for preserving her right to file a motion for the exclusive purpose of making a claim for the excess proceeds. In that hearing, the court made it abundantly clear that it was troubled by Tobin's repeated filings and admonished her that if Ms. Tobin continues to file seriatim motions with this court, that are devoid of legal merit, then the court will have no other choice but to issue an order to show cause why Ms. Tobin should not be declared a vexation, vexatious litigant. That order, notice of entry of order, was filed on January the 17th of 2023. And the certificate of service states that I, the undersigned, declare under penalty of perjury that I am over the age of 18 and I am not a party to nor interested in this action. I certify that on January 17, 2023, I caused the foregoing document entitled Notice of Entry of Order to be electronically filed and served with the 8th Judicial District Court, County of Clark, State of Nevada e-file system. And it's signed by Andrea Eschenbaugh of Kingscow Koch Durham LLC. Now, it does not indicate, Mr. Scow, that Ms. Tobin, it doesn't indicate on that certificate of service that she was specifically served. I don't know, as we sit here right now, if she is registered for e-file and serve. No, Your Honor, I believe she is, but I can double check on that. Um, because it looks like on the e-filing service details for the notification of service on the original January 6, 2023. Let me see the other. Okay, it does appear the 1-3-2023 e-file service list has her at nonatobin at gmail.com. Um, let me see if the, and it's on the 1-6-2023 one as well, the one ten, as well. Um, so the court has no reason to believe that she's not still on the e-file and serve, and therefore she did receive notice of the order. Um, and more so, the court notes as a finding of fact that it says motion to reconsider the 116 order, which also indicates that she received the January 16th order. So she has been provided with notice that if she filed, continued to file motions that were devoid of legal merit, that the court was going to declare her a vexatious litigant. The notice provision is important for the following reasons. Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I what? just said I 
quick message to my office, and they checked on the service list, and Ms. Tobin is on the list. Okay. And they also show that she opened the notice of entry. Perfect. So it, it shows that she did receive Okay, it. perfect. The notice issue is important for the following reasons. In order to declare somebody a vexatious litigant, they must have notice. Under the Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure, a party that presents a pleading, written motion, or other paper to the court must certify that it is not being presented for any improper purpose, such as to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation that the claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are warranted by existing law or by a non-frivolous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing law or for establishing new law, the factual contentions have evidentiary support or, if specifically so identified, will likely have evidentiary support after a reasonable opportunity for further investigation or discovery, and the denials or of factual contentions are warranted on the evidence or, if specifically so identified, are reasonably be based on belief or a lack of information. After providing a party with notice and a reasonable opportunity to respond, the court may determine that a party has violated NRCP 11B and the court may impose an appropriate sanction. The sanction must be limited to what suffices to deter repetition of the conduct or comparable conduct by others similarly situated. When a pro se litigant proceeds in form of papyrus, however, the threat of monetary sanctions or professional discipline is ineffective to deter abusive litigation practices. That is Jordan versus State X Rail Department of Motor Vehicles, 110 P3rd 30, Nevada 2005. Based on the Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure and on Nevada Court's inherent powers of equity and of control over the exercise of their jurisdiction, Nevada courts have the power to permanently restrict a litigant's right to access to the courts. Jordan versus State X Rail Department of Motor Vehicles provides a four-part analysis for Nevada courts issuing restrictive orders. To declare an individual a vexatious litigant and impose a restrictive order, the court must first provide the litigant with reasonable notice and an opportunity to oppose the restrictive order's issuance. In this case, Ms. Tobin not only filed on June the 27th when the plaintiff in this case attempted to have her declared a vexatious litigant, she filed her opposition to same. She was placed on notice at the hearing that if she continued to file seriatim motions that were devoid of factual and legal merit, that she would be declared a vexatious litigant. She received that order on January the 17th of 2023, and yet she filed another motion to reconsider on the same issues that have been denied over and over and over again. Based on that, the court finds that Ms. Tobin has been provided notice and an opportunity to oppose her being declared a vexatious litigant. The court also notes that under Jordan, notice and opportunity will be sufficient even if the litigant does not attend the hearing on the matter. She could have been here today. It's now 11, 12, and we have received no email, no notice that she is going to be here, and she has made it a choice not to attend. Under the four-part analysis, the second thing the court must do is create an adequate record for review. The record must contain a list of all the cases and documents or an explanation of the reasons that led the court to conclude that a restrictive order was needed to curb repetitive or abusive activities. I believe, based on the last half an hour, the court has made a sufficient record as to the documents that have been filed into this case and the actions that have been taken by Ms. Tobin that show that a restrictive order is needed to curb both repetitive and abusive activities. 
The court also needs to make substantive finding as to the frivolous or harassing nature of the litigant's actions. The court finds that the motion to, that the, um, the request for the court to take judicial notice of the uh, alleged attorney misconduct was inappropriate, was legally devoid of merit, and is doing nothing except for attempting to harass the attorneys that have been involved in this matter. Finally, the court's restrictive order must be narrowly drawn to address the specific problem encountered and should set an appropriate standard against which any future filings will be me measured. Constitutional considerations prohibit a complete ban on filings, but a restrictive order may be narrowly drawn if it bars a litigant from filing new actions unless the court reviews the filing and determines that it is not frivolous brought for an improper purpose or implicates a fundamental right. In this case, based on the, although she filed a motion to withdraw the request for judicial notice, in those requests for judicial notice, to the extent that she indicated that she was going to be filing complaints against the individual attorneys that have been involved in both the lead case that was involved in this, the secondary case, and the case that's currently in front of this court, um, the court is going to enjoin her from filing any complaints until those complaints are first sent for review to the chief judge of the district court. If upon review of those complaints, the chief judge determines that Ms. Tobin's complaint alleges a cognizable legal claim and the claim is supported by sufficient factual allegations that have not been addressed and disposed of already by our Supreme Court, then the chief judge shall send um, Ms. Tobin's complaint to the clerk's office for filing without any further review for merit. If Ms. Tobin's complaint is meritless, or if it fails to allege a cognizable legal claim, Ms. Tobin's complaint shall be sent back to her unfiled. Ms. Tobin is enjoined from filing anything other than a timely notice of appeal into this case in regards to the motion to reconsider that has been denied and advanced to today. Regarding this ongoing case, to the extent that we still have the unopposed motion or based on this court's inclination to grant the amounts that are sitting in the interplied funds to her based on the foreclosure and what was properly supposed to be contributed to her. The court indicated at the last hearing that um, counsel could submit a Brunzel affidavit for the amount of fees that were reasonably incurred um, and that, that those amounts would be deducted from the foreclosure fees um, or the foreclosure funds that are to be, excuse me, that are to be turned over to Ms. Tobin. So she will be allowed in this action once you file your Brunzel affidavit, um, now that we have an order in place, 
she will be allowed to file an opposition as to those fees um, and she will be allowed to file anything in relation to um, an objection to the amount that she will receive of the interpled funds. Anything else that she files in this case except for those three items, notice of appeal, objection to the Brunzel, or objection to the amount received under the interpled funds will be um, will be dismissed. But before she even submit those to this department, she will need to submit any proposed filing to this department to the inbox for review prior to filing. If the filing presents one of those three grounds that the court has indicated and is otherwise procedurally proper, then I will allow for that document to be filed. If not, then I will not allow that document to be filed and it will be returned to her as unfiled. If she, is re if she becomes represented by legal counsel, she's currently in pro per, then no review of complaints or filings will be necessary. Ms. Tobin's repetitious, rogue, harassing, and unmeritorious motions in this case provide a sufficient record to support a vexatious litigant filing. Ms. Tobin was provided with reasonable notice and was given ample opportunity to respond. She appeared before the court and she provided argument and at that time the court did not declare her a vexatious litigant but thoroughly warned her and made sure that she understood that if she continued in her filings that were legally and factually devoid of merit that the court would have no other choice but to declare her a vexatious litigant. Based on the foregoing, the court declares Ms. Tobin a vexatious litigant and denies the motion to reconsider that is being advanced to today. And Mr. Scow, I know it's going to take you a little bit of time, but if you could prepare the order on this because I need you to lay out. That's why I spoke slowly so that you could get, if you wanted to just get the jabs, so that you could prepare the order in the matter. All right? We are, we're, we're happy to do that. And we'll, I guess my thought is to, we'll probably request a transcript. That's fine. Last time after the July hearing, it took about three months to come, but hopefully this one will be quicker. I think it'll probably be quicker, but that's why I spoke slowly too, so that you could get the jabs if you wanted. Um, and at least start on the order because I'd like to get this on file sooner rather than later. Right. Um, to the extent um, we will do, I would like to do a minute order on this that the hearing from the 8th and the 28th were advanced to today and I would like to provide and, and denied um, and that there will be a substantive order forthcoming but I would like um, that to be specifically provided, so e-filed and served to Ms. Tobin on the minute order, okay? So at least that way she knows not to appear on the 28th. However, in the event that she does in fact appear, if you could just jump on on the 28th so that I can just let her know that an order will be prepared and that she will be receiving it so that she understands that I've advanced everything in case she doesn't get this one. Um, but, yeah. Your Honor, that, that's fine. I think there's a, um, actually, so the hearing on the 8th, is that a chamber's hearing only? It was. I advanced that to today, too. What's that? I advanced that to today, too. Right, right. But I'm just saying, I, I'm happy to appear and I'll plan to appear on the 28th. I'm just wondering, 
if the eighth hearing was in chambers and there, there was, would be no appearance right. right so the only one that was really coming up was the one on the 28th okay okay well we can do that and we'll have our you know Brenzel motion actually have that nearly done and we were only focusing on the fees that were incurred to oppose that particular motion we right we're not including anything else since right anything from today we're just going to focus right. on that and so if you can do that and what I would like to do is if you could also add into the order um, leave a blank spot because I'm going to try and see whether or not we can dispose of this entire case with this final order if you can leave a blank spot for the amount of fees for the Brunzel, I'll take a look at it and I'll interlineate that. And then the amount that she would be entitled to from those funds, leave a spot for that too. And we can say in the order, it's therefore ordered that Red Rock Financial Services shall turn over to Ms. Tobin the amount of blank. And hopefully that will, at least that'll be a final order. And then if she wants to file anything with the Supreme Court, at least that way we've got a final order so we're not doing needlessly NRCP 54B certs. Okay? Right. And that, you know, that's a good suggestion. We'd actually caption, you know, as part of the Brenzel, we were going to do a motion. But I will, I'm going to modify that so it's just a... Do an affidavit. An affidavit yep. in support of... Yes. Then we won't have to have a hearing. Because the affidavit would be in support of what the court ordered from the last order. Yes. So I think that you can just submit an affidavit in support of the fees because I already said that I would award them based on a Brunzel affidavit. Okay. So just do a Brunzel affidavit for me. That's a good suggestion. That'll be easier. All right. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Thank you, Your Honor. And this is, uh, I guess I want to note too, is you, you referenced during your your comments that it's been problematic for the attorneys on all sides, but I'll note it's also been vexatious, I believe is the word, for the courts. Yes. So there's, there's support in that regard, too, because the court is very busy, and there's a lot of time that's spent. We, we know you spend a lot of time going through things, so we appreciate that, but thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Ms. Turley, anything on, on no. your behalf? All right. No, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good day. Thanks for coming down. Appreciate yep. it. Yep. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.